So, some of you know me, I'm Lydia Yuknovich, and some of you don't know me, and the first thing I want to say to you is that I don't think of writing the way other people think of it. And I didn't come to writing the same way other people did. I didn't go into an MFA program. My teachers weren't in a college. And I became a writer because I had several life experiences that sort of spasmed my body and changed me forever. And so writing started coming out of me. And if you've heard of the book I wrote called The Chronology of Water, it's a good example of what I'm talking about. So I want to share with anybody who's interested a different way to think about writing. And I've invented a series of workshops I call corporeal writing because writing came from my body and the forms I write in came from my life experience. And I'm looking for a way to do that with other people. That doesn't involve paying for an MFA program or other forms of traditional learning to write. So I want to take you with me on a sort of tour of how it happens in my mind, what I'm talking about. So I called it corporeal writing, which is really just a fancy way of saying body writing. So I believe making art and writing in particular is not just a literary practice, but also a life practice. And I understand that a lot of you want to be published and it's what I wanted too. But along the way, I realized that that's the least interesting, most narrow way to think about what writing can be. And so even though I want to help you get published, if that's what you want, I also want to broaden your understanding of what writing can be. And I think it can be something that changes your life, not just, you know, a fancy publication opportunity. But before I take you through that, and before I ask you to do anything, I want to express two key ideas to you. And you just have to think about them or believe in them for however long this lasts, which is a few minutes. The first one is that your body is an experience collector. And you don't need to go out there to find ideas for stories. You're living them every day. And the second idea, and you can throw this out after I talk to you, but the second idea is your life is a zeitgeist. The time you're living in, the place you're living in, whatever your community is, whatever your people around you are, it's a kind of zeitgeist. It's a different way of seeing the world and being in the world than has ever happened before. And so if those two things are temporarily true, between us right now. My question is, can we invent some new forms for telling stories that are linked to those two ideas? And my feeling is we can't. So that's where I'm going right now. So we're used to thinking about telling short stories or making a chapter for a novel or writing an essay in tr very traditional forms. And you can go to school and learn those forms, even though that's not where I learned them. I learned them from reading books and loving art and paying attention and making lists and talking to people. But these traditions, they're incredibly important. And I'm not going to take your tradition away from you, I promise. I'm not going to take those things you hold so dear about how you write away from you. You can keep one foot in the tradition. I'm just suggesting that Maybe in our time, in our place, we might want to invent some new forms and new ways of doing things that correspond to how it feels to live your life right now. So one way to approach either creating new material or working with material you already have is to zoom in not on what it's about or getting a description of the events down perfectly, which I promise you, you don't need me to do. You could do that alone in your underwear without me, 
pretty easily. The sequence of events, you got that. I want to talk to you briefly about something called exhausting a metaphor, which I of course stole from poets and also painters. If you think of George O'Keefe, for example, there's a consistent metaphor to 99.9% .9 of her work. If you think of Faulkner, there's consistent metaphors. If you think of Emily Dickinson, we could all pull up examples where the core metaphors for those people tend to reappear. Well, they didn't just go like this and make a metaphor and put it on the page and boom, that was that. They excavated their lives to find them. When I was writing the chronology of water, I didn't know that water was one of my primary metaphors. It took another person looking at my work to show it to me, to get a flashlight and shine it on the pages or I would never have seen it. And how it happened was I wrote a short story with some fragments about my life in it. And I turned the fragments in and everybody in the writing workshop made fun of me because my story didn't look like anybody else's and half the people thought it was a poem. And I knew it wasn't a poem, but I didn't know how to fight back and explain to them why it really was a new way to tell a story. And the person I was working with at the time was a woman named Diana Abujaber. And even though all my classmates made fun of me, when she handed it back to me, she had circled a whole bunch of things on the pages. And when I looked at what she'd circles and I talked to her, she had pointed out to me and illuminated that I had created a whole series of metaphors that had to do with water. Not just one kind of water like the ocean, but swimming pools and showers and blood and tears and rain. And she saw them and they stood out to her. They didn't stand out to me because I wasn't thinking. But when I looked at those circled words and ideas and I saw how many times water appeared, I instantly transformed as a thinker and an artist and a writer because I saw that my sub subconscious had created a way for me to tell a story. So we're going to do that together. And every time I see people, we write for like 10 hours in a workshop, but we write the whole time. And we talk to each other about what we've written. So the first thing you have to do is you have to identify for yourself on a piece of paper, 10 possible metaphors that you have seen yourself use in more than one story and more than one essay, more than one poem, more than one whatever kind of writing. Mine are water, art, the body, war, and if you've read anything I've written, those should sound familiar because I write about them over and over again. Sexuality, you see how those kind of sound like my writing? Well, you have them too. And I'm asking you to just make a list briefly of 10 of them. And if you're lying about the last five, I don't care. We're just doing an exercise. So you make 10 of them. Ordinarily, if we were in a room together, I would be sitting here patiently waiting for you to make this 10 metaphor list. So I don't really want to sit here and wait for you to make the 10 item metaphor list. So I'm just going to keep telling you what to do. After you've got 10 of them, I want you to choose the five that sound the most true. This really is a metaphor I return to. Three to five. And I want you to write a sentence for each that says what that metaphor is to you. For example, water is life-giving for Lydia, even though that sounds cheesy. That would be true, right? I want you to write five sentences for your five metaphors you've selected out. One sentence that's saying what it is. And again, instead of waiting for you and sharing them and talking to each other about it, which is what I would prefer to do, because I need to be with people to generate material. <laughs> I'm just going to keep going. So now you've got these five senses, right? And they say what metaphors are. Now I want you to choose three of those that sound the most true to you or possibly true to you. And I want to put one on the top 
of three different pages, and that's your prompt. You're using it maybe as a warm-up to do other writing because you're approaching a chapter you're in. You're doing it because it's in a chapter or it's in an essay or it's in a story and you want to get more out of it. But you're going to fill three pages using those lines as a prompt. In my example, water is life-giving. Maybe I go to a memory I have. Maybe I go to my thoughts on that matter. Maybe I go to a swimming pool. Maybe I go to an ocean. Maybe I go to the primordial waters that existed when dinosaurs were around. Maybe I go to the goo in a mother's belly. I don't know, but that's your prompt. Why am I having you go through this, take a metaphor and multiply the possible meanings of it? Because the mistake we make in all of our work is we think coming up with a metaphor makes us special and pretty. And it's not enough. What poets know and what painters know is that you have to drill down into your metaphors to surface more material that is cool about them to use in a story. So yeah, I'm starting off with a figurative exercise, unlike other people. And yeah, I'm going in a weird place with it, unlike other people. But I promise you, if you write these three pages, you're going to discover something. You're going to explore something you don't already know. Because you want to know what's deadly to writers doing what you already know. It's dull and you can't discover anything. So come to my house when you want to. No, don't come to my house. That's frightening. Come work with me when you want to do something everyone else isn't showing you how to do. And I'll get new material to come out of you differently than anyone has by and through your body. Hey, if any ideas in this video resonated with you, please let us know in the comments. You can ask a question or take a shot at the assignment or share what you'd like to explore in upcoming talks. We'd love it if you'd like, comment, and share, and we'll be sure to reward those actions because I love presents. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel and join us at corporealwriting.online to make sure you don't miss what's coming up next. Because what's coming up next is a writing revolution. Art matters. Thanks.